Labor law is an intervention in the market for labor that, by establishing some minimum standards, resists employment arrangements from pushing conditions of work below levels that are considered acceptable. In India, most of these standards have been established through central or state statutes and enforced through a system of labor inspectors and labor courts and tribunals. We also learned how there is a parallel system of international labor standards and learned how they may or may not apply to India. We also learned that even when India has not ratified an international standard, such a standard may operate as a model for Indian law to aspire for. This is also important because of the international nature of the market for labor. Global supply chains have a choice of different regions to source their labor from, and weaker labor protections can be one of the factors that guide their decisions. Now, along with this national situation here, as I said, we need to bring in the international context. First of all, the suppliers are not independent agents. They, first of all, are contracted to the brands who are the monopolies in the world economy. They are monopsonies in the sense that they, you know, there are many, many suppliers and very few brands. And it is very easy for a supplier to be threatened that, okay, if you can't do it for, you know, five paise less per piece, I'll take the order to Bangladesh or Vietnam or somewhere else. So really, this is what we call a monopsony, where there are very few buyers and very many such sellers. Hello and welcome back to the second module of this course on decent work for women. In the last video, we learned some legal standards in relation to collective bargaining. None of the employment relationships to which they apply can stifle collective bargaining practices in violation of those standards. We will now learn about the standards in relation to some other aspects of work. The first is that of wages. The Minimum Wages Act of 1948 provides for fixing of minimum rates of wages in certain employments. That is, it creates the mechanism for setting the lowest remuneration that employers can legally pay their employees. The minimum wages are prescribed by state governments through notifications in that state's gazette under its minimum wages rules. Article 43 of the Constitution of India requires the state to secure to all workers, agricultural, industrial or otherwise, a living wage. Let us now learn from one of our experts about the wages paid in the garment industry. Now, the first point is, how, what is the meaning of fair wages? How do we define a fair wage? It seems a very difficult concept in de to define, but, and actually the contracts that the brands, the international brands which you know about, like or, or Walmart, et cetera, the big brands that are really the buyers of these contract garments that are produced by the supplier factories in India or other countries of Asia. These are mainly, the contracts are based on labor, which is costed on a national minimum wage. So whatever is the national minimum wage in a country, on that basis, these contracts are made. So the minimum wage is supposed to be respected for all workers. But the problem is, that these minimum wages, national minimum wages, are much below what we may call a living wage. A fair wage, if we want to define it in that way, is actually a living wage. So what do we mean by a living wage? We mean by a living wage, wages that are necessary for a worker and her family, not just for the worker alone, but for her family to meet the necessary food, clothing, housing, education for children, some uh, medical expenses, minimal education. Nowadays, we all require some form of TV. Most workers would do have TVs in their homes, but we all require some entertainment and some discretionary money or savings. Now, this has been calculated in a number of ways. The, there is an organization called the Asia Floor Wage Association, which has carried out a calculation for a number of countries of Asia, including India. And the Indian fair uh, living wage comes to about 23,000 rupees for a worker in the year 2019. That is one year ago before this pandemic struck and things changed in a way. So, but anyway, not so long ago, just one year ago, it was about 23,000 rupees 
for a worker. Now, this is not such an absurdly high type of requirement or demand. In fact, India's central trade unions have asked that in the coming pay commission, all government, the minimum salary for a government employee, what we call the class four employee, the lowest level category of work, employees in the government should be 18,000 rupees a month, which besides that 18,000, they also get housing from the government. But the housing has to be paid for out of the workers' wages in the, in the context of government workers or any other workers who are not in the public sector in India. So therefore, 23,000 is a month is not such a high figure. <clears throat> Besides the Asia Flood Wage Alliance, which is an alliance of a number of unions, there has also been a calculation made by a former ILO research officer, Richard Anker, who has calculated a similar a figure for the, for the living wage in India for the town of Tirupur or the cluster of Tirupur. And it came to almost the same as the Asia floor wage calculation. So there's not, not much difference between these different calculations. Now, what we have to understand is that this actually, this, the, uh, the, the floor wage as it is calculated by the, the living wage as calculated by the Asia Floor Wage Alliance actually also includes the monetary value of what is now unpaid domestic work. This is important. You know, domestic work is not paid for. It is not calculated in wages. But the point is that the worker who works work eight hours a day in a factory really has little energy left to do much domestic work and therefore requires not only to share with her husband, but also to buy a number of the services which are otherwise commercially available. If you go to a, a country like Thailand or even China, for instance, you will find that most workers do not cook at home. They buy cooked food from the street. They, it is very good street food that you will get in Bangkok, but they don't cook. And that is the point is that cooking really takes a lot of time. So child care, of course, is something essential. But if you bring all of these requirements, that is the domestic services that are required in order to turn a wage into goods that are consumed. I mean, just because you buy rice and wheat and vegetables or meat, it doesn't turn into food that you and I can eat. It has to be cooked. It, then you have to clean up and all of that work has to be done. So the wage to be turned into consumption requires labor and that labor also needs to be brought into the calculation. So all of this together gives you the floor wage or the living wage of around 23,000 rupees a month or something like 300 to 350 US dollars a month across different countries of Asia. It will be a little higher in some countries where the standard of living is higher. For instance, in China, it would be higher than in India. So the standard of living of a country does come in into the calculation. It would, of course, be much higher in a country like, say, the USA, where having a car is part of a requirement for being a for being having a reasonable living. You can't be, a, you know, you can't really live in a reasonable way in the U.S. without a car. Public transport is so little, so a car and its expenses become part of it. So the living wage differs from one country to another, and but however, the national minimum wage, as they have been set up in different countries of Asia, as I said, are much lower than this minimum wage than this living wage in India. The national minimum, we don't have one single national minimum wage, but even if you take an average of all the wages, say between Tirupur, it is highest in Delhi and NCR, it is lo lower and much lower in Tirupur and Tamil Nadu. But if you take all of these together, we only get a figure of about 35% of the living wage being covered by the wage paid to a garment worker. So therefore, this is the first violation of human rights that we will find in the garment workers value, the garment value chain, that workers paid by living according to minimum wages are given much less than what is really required for a reasonable living in the modern world. That is the first point. The Minimum Wage Fixing Convention of 1970, which is Convention 131 of the ILO, 
requires ratifying states to establish a machinery to fix the minimum wage that has the force of law, that is capable of determining and periodically reviewing and adjusting minimum wage rates. India has not ratified this convention. The Payment of Wages Act of 1936 seeks to ensure that employers make timely payment of wages to employees and prevent some types of deductions from wages. The Payment of Bonus Act of 1965 provides for the payment of bonus either on the basis of profits or on the basis of production or productivity to some types of employees employed in some types of establishments. We learned previously in this course that on average, men are paid more than women and that this gap is higher in informal work. Let us learn what standards have emerged in law in relation to the payment of wages to men and women for the same work. Article 14 of the Constitution of India states that the state shall not deny any person equality before the law or the equal protection of laws within the territory of India. Article 39D, a non-justiciable directive principle, requires the state to move the country towards a situation where there is equal pay for equal work for both men and women. The constitutional principle of equal pay for equal work applies to non-regular employees as well, India's Supreme Court has said. These constitutional principles are advanced through the Equal Remuneration Act of 1976, which prohibits employers from discriminating on the grounds of sex when it comes to remuneration provided for the same amount and nature of work. Work of a similar nature is defined as work for which the skill, effort, experience and responsibility required are the same. This law was later amended to prohibit discrimination in recruitment and conditions of service as well. The Code on Wages of 2019 was notified in August 2019 but has yet not come into effect. When it does, it will replace the Payment of Wages Act of 1936, the Minimum Wages Act of 1948, the Payment of Bonus Act of 1965 and the Equal Remuneration Act of 1976. The Equal Remuneration Convention of 1951 states that each member of the convention should ensure the application to all workers of the principle of equal remuneration for men and women workers for work of equal value. This is a fundamental convention of the ILO and India has ratified it. Now the third point, gender equality in wages. The first point of gender equality is that there should be equal wages for equal work. There is more or less that, but what happens is that women are categorized by skill differently from men. Women are tailors, men are also tailors, but you'll find the men tailors is categorized as semi-skilled or skilled, while the women tailors are largely categorized as unskilled. Now, unskilled is also a wrong term because they obviously do have some skill. You may better call them low skilled, but the point is they are tailors with the same number of years of, see, of experience as the men, but they never ever get categorized at the same level. So it is through the miscategorization of women as low skilled workers that a pay difference is maintained between women and men in the garment factories. We have seen in our research that the pay difference can be quite substantial. It's like 15 to 20 percent of the wage. That is men earn 15 to 20 percent more than women do because they are at a, generally at a higher skill level. So this is the inequality which there is because of the gender biased skill categorization. Now I did mention but I'll go back to this again. So are these human rights issues? They are. First of all, the Indian constitution does guarantee you the right to life and it has been interpreted as meaning the right to a reasonable life, not just to be living, but to be living in a reasonable manner as we expect in India today. As I pointed out when talking about living wages, a reasonable life in India is not the same as a reasonable life in the USA. It's much cheaper. You don't need a car in India. You would not expect to have a car to be living a reasonable life. But you would expect to have a, re a good education for your children and man some manner of housing, 
even the workers, housing is of course very horrible over here. You know, most of them live really in slum or semi-slum conditions. There is no uh, housing provided for these workers. So, but the Indian constitution does guarantee that. The Supreme Court in its judgments, which is uh, some of which are well known, like the Raptor Cause Bread Judgment and others, also pointed out that the minimum wage should not be a starvation wage, but should be actually a living wage. Though they didn't define what is a living wage, but they did make the statement that there should be a living wage. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights also refers to the fact that we require to have living wages. In fact, the ILO's founding declaration in, in 1919, it's about 100 years ago, starts with talking about the importance of living wages for workers, as even not, not only for workers themselves, but even as a factor for world peace. The SDGs, as I mentioned, now also have brought decent work into the agenda. So all of these point to the, uh, make the point that yes, living wages are a part of a human rights issues and they need to be, with, uh, they need to become the basic wage in any country. That is, the, that is then the major point with regard to the human rights issue. Another aspect of work that labor law has set standards for is that of social security. This is a term that refers to any scheme that protects people against poverty and deprivation or the consequences of poverty, such as inadequate health care. In the context of labor law, it usually refers to a government scheme that protects against loss of incomes or low incomes either through insurance schemes or other welfare benefits. Here again, we must note that the government of India has consolidated the laws that we are about to discuss into a single social security code, which has not yet been brought into effect. The Employees Provident Funds and Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 1952 provides for the institution of provident funds, pension funds and deposit-linked insurance funds for employees. The Employees State Insurance Act of 1948 provides for medical relief, cash benefits, maternity benefits, pension to the dependents of deceased workers, and compensation for fatal or other injuries and diseases. Both the employee and the employer are expected to make a contribution of a proportion of the wages towards these funds. The employer contributes a higher proportion, and it is the employer's responsibility to deposit such contributions of all employees. Both these laws apply only to establishments that employ a certain number of employees. For workers of smaller establishments, the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act of 2008 enables the central government to create welfare schemes for unorganized sector workers. The Employees Compensation Act of 1923 addresses compensation and other benefits that the employer must provide employees in relation to their temporary or permanent physical disablement due to injuries and diseases that result in reduced earning capacity. The Payment of Gratuity Act of 1972 The Payment of Gratuity Act of 1972 provides for a scheme for the payment of gratuity, a sum given, upon the termination of their employment to employees who have completed continuous service of five years or more, irrespective of his wages. Let us pause here to remind ourselves once again of the critical perspective that we must apply to labor law and international labor standards as part of this course. Remember that labor law and labor standards operate in an environment that is gender unequal. Remember also that most working women in India and other countries at similar stages of development are engaged in informal work. So think about these standards from the perspective of informal or non-regular workers and think about the difficulties that women workers in particular will face in making claims under these laws. The international standards on the subject consider social security under the different themes, namely medical care, sickness, unemployment, old age, employment injury, family, maternity, invalidity, and survivor's benefits. Let us learn about some important conventions. The Social Security Minimum Standards Convention of 1952, which is Convention 102 of the ILO, sets out a minimum standard for these nine aspects. States can determine the level of minimum with reference to their level of wages. States are permitted to ratify the convention by accepting the standards related to at least three aspects and subsequently accept the obligations under the others. India has not ratified this convention. 
the Social Protection Flaws Recommendation of 2012, which is Convention Number 202, provides guidance on introducing or maintaining social protection floors and on implementing social protection floors. The Equality of Treatment Social Security Convention of 1962, which is Convention Number 118, creates obligations for countries in relation to social security benefits for migrant workers. Ratifying countries are obliged to have effective legislation on one or more of the nine aspects of social security. India has ratified the parts of the convention related to medical care, sickness benefit and maternity benefit. The Maintenance of Social Security Rights Convention of 1982, which is Convention number 157, applies to all branches of social security, regardless of the type of scheme. It provides for some social security rights and benefits for migrant workers who face the problem of losing entitlements to social security benefits that they enjoyed in their country of origin. Its objective is to promote a flexible and broad form of coordination between the social security schemes of different countries. India has not ratified this convention. The precarity of their employment was exposed by, very cruelly exposed by the lack of social security, which we saw over this year after the lockdown. All of you, all of us in India know very well what was happening. After a couple of few days, we started seeing on our TV screens the numbers of workers who were trying to go back. Now, in this trying to go back, there's a very strange thing that happened. In some of the garment clusters, actually, they tried to stop these workers going back because the employers were worried that, okay, when the factories start again, where will we get the workers from? So they actually stopped them going back and, and tried to forcibly re restrain them. Now, a number of factories in particularly Tirupur, et cetera, have what is called a dormitory. They have a small little uh, settlement for workers to live in often within the factory compound. So they would just lock these women in those, in those compounds and not let them go out. You know, some state governments refuse to provide transport. The Karnataka government said, look, you know, if we provide transport for these workers to go back, how will they come back? They won't come when, they, when the factories start again. So along with not having any social security, they were even being treated as bonded labor as workers who would not be allowed to even have the freedom of mobility and the right to go back when they wanted to. So they were not paid wages for the period. Many of the you know, contract labor, the contractors just ran away, switched off their mobile phones and nobody could contact them. So they were not paid even for work that they had already done. Contract labor was not paid. Home workers were also not paid for work that they had already completed before the lockdown, just as our supplier factories were also not paid. I mean, the brands did not pay the suppliers they, for work that had already been done, even work that had been supplied to them and reached their warehouses in Europe or America. They wanted discounts on that saying, look, you know, we can't sell, so we need to, we need, you need to give us a discount. Now, the brands were given money by their country governments to be able to carry on business. There were a lot of support given in those countries because they have a lot of fiscal capacity to be able to provide money in the event of an economic recession. But they did not pay the suppliers and the suppliers in turn did not pay the contract, uh, the workers, and so they were left with nothing. They, the government, as you know, again, did not provide any social security. In India, they, only a few women got this 500 rupees per month in their Jandhan accounts. So what did they do? Uh, uh, well, they did get some PDS food from the, uh, from the ration shops or the fair price shops, the subsidized food. But you know, you can't just live on rice and dal alone, even the dal was very little. You need to have other things, you need some spices, you need oil, etc., even to cook. And so they were not able to really manage with that. So they had to draw on one, their own savings, which was depleted very quickly. They had to, many had to borrow money 
in order to, at very high rates of interest, I've not seen rates of interest like this for a long time. I mean, eight to 10% a month as a rate of interest to be paid for borrowing a little money on which to live or to feed your children. And then they sold their assets. They had to sell whatever little they had just in order to survive. Those workers who had provident fund accounts withdrew money from their provident fund. This means, you know, the provident fund money is usually used for, say, children's education or a girl's marriage, etc. But they had to withdraw that money just to survive. So they had to jeopardize their own future just to be able to survive. Now, this was the very miserable state in which the garment workers were left after the lockdowns as a result of one the brands not paying the suppliers, the suppliers not paying the workers, the contractors not paying the workers, and the government not providing any social security. A combination of actions by the employers and the, governor and the governments resulted in a, a real disaster for the garment workers, like other workers in India, in the, in the precariously employed workers. Very few workers were given at least part of their salaries, and those were the permanent workers. Hmm? The rest got nothing. So this was the situation with no social security. So we have two major issues of human rights violations. One is that of wages, where the wages paid are very low, nothing like a living wage, resulting in high overtime, with the work quotas resulting in women being pushed out of the factory at a very young age. And second, we have the issues around the lack of social security, whether through the employer or through the government. The next aspect of work that we will learn relates to conditions of work other than remuneration or wages. Think about the hours of work, holidays and days of rest, and standards for the safety and health of the workers. Once again, let us remember to consider the perspective of women workers who bear the burden of care work at home. The directive principles of state policy in India's constitution encourage the state to provide for securing just and humane conditions of work and for maternity relief and secure to all workers conditions of work ensuring a decent standard of life and full enjoyment of leisure and social and cultural opportunities. The Factories Act of 1948 lays down provisions for the health, safety, welfare and service conditions of workers in some factories. It applies to all factories employing more than 10 people and using electricity or employing 20 people and working without the aid of power. It covers all workers employed in the factory premises or precincts directly or employed under contract through an agency. Some of the standards set by the Factories Act relate to the working hours of adults, leave and overtime, cleanliness, ventilation and temperature, availability of drinking water, clean and convenient toilets, fencing of dangerous machinery, and first aid facilities. Factories where 30 or more women workers are ordinarily employed are to be equipped with creche facilities or nurseries for children under the age of 6 years. There are also provisions regarding the cleaning of floors and the effective removal of dirt and refuse. The Act also obliges employers to ensure adequate lighting and ventilation, measures to prevent the inhalation of dust and fumes, measures to prevent overcrowding on factory premises, fencing of dangerous machinery, providing suitable gear or appliances, take precautions against explosives, and so on. It prescribes that limits be placed on the weights that men and women workers are required to lift or carry. The state governments can appoint inspectors to enforce these standards. Similarly, the Shops and Commercial Establishments Acts of the different states contain provisions that set the standards for some conditions of work such as working hours, overtime, leave and the working conditions for women employees. These laws apply to a category of establishments to which the Factories Act does not apply, including commercial and trading establishments, restaurants and theatres. The state governments also have powers to appoint officials to conduct inspections and enforce compliance with these standards. The Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act of 1946 requires every employer in an industrial establishment, defined as an establishment that has employed 100 workmen at least once in the preceding 12 months, to clearly define and publish standing orders with respect to conditions of employment and service rules, make them known to its workmen and display them in a prominent place. The state-specific rules framed 
under the IESO Act provide for model standing orders, which are a set of default conditions applicable to those industrial establishments that have not framed their own standing orders or to those industrial establishments that are awaiting certification from the government on their own standing orders. The Weekly Holiday Act of 1942 provides for weekly holidays for those employed in shops, restaurants and theatres. Now, what happens when the women do not get a living wage? The first point is that they have to do overtime work. For eight hours a day, in fact, they don't calculate it only for eight, they give a certain quota, which may take you longer than eight hours to cover. So then you may take nine hours or 10 hours to just earn what you should get in eight hours. But on top of that, they have to do overtime. They have to work extra hours just in order to manage to meet something or the other. You know, most of these workers are migrants and they have to send money back home. That's why they've come here to work. Because as you saw during the pandemic and the lockdowns, you know, the millions of workers who tried and their families who tried to go back home because they were, uh, their, their employment was lost in the urban centers. So they need to be able to send their families money the children and the parents are often left back in the village and they need to send money for their survival and for their expenses. <clears throat> Therefore, they are forced to work overtime in order to be able to manage some kind of approximation. They never get near the living wage. Both husband and wife would have to work together if they are able to get near the living wage, but one person cannot manage the living wage. That is the first point. The Maternity Benefit Act of 1961 regulates the employment of women in certain establishments for a certain period before and after childbirth and provides for maternity benefits and other benefits including maternity leave, wages, bonus and nursing breaks to women employees. In 2017, this law was amended to increase the duration of paid maternity leave available for women employees from 12 to 26 weeks for the first two children. It also obliges employers to provide a work-from-home option after the maternity leave expires, mandatory creche or daycare facilities for every establishment employing 50 or more employees, and the right of mothers to visit the creche four times each day. Employers are also obligated to educate employees about these benefits. So what happens as a result of low wages, high overtime and very strict work quotas? We will see how this leads to even more violations of human rights because of these factors coming together. I mentioned earlier that low wages forces workers to work overtime in order to get a little bit more. Managers, all managers will tell you, you know, oh, they don't work in our factory unless we have overtime available. That's correct because they want to maximize the amount that they can earn while they're able to earn and they don't work for very long time in that. And, but they have very high quotas of to be work to be completed in a say a one year in, in, in order to earn the minimum wage. So what do they do? What happens as a result of this high quota, high overtime and low wages? One, you'll find that in many factories, in most, women drink less water so as not to have to go to the toilet and therefore re reduce their time in production. In fact, in some factories, only if they meet a certain quota, are they then given a token to go to the toilet. So they have to work extra hard just to be able to go to the toilet or they, they just don't drink water the whole, whole day while they're at work. So you can imagine what that does to the health of the women. They have poor nutritional standards because of their very low wages. Hardly do they consume any eggs or uh, even dahi or milk or such protein or even much dal. We have, we have done calculations of this and we have seen that the amounts consumed are very low. And of course, women consume even less than men do. But overall, there is a very poor consumption of nutritious foods and particularly the protein rich foods. Along with poor working conditions, this often leads to women fainting while at work. In samples we have done in a, in a number of these centers, we have found that 25% of women workers in the garment factories have reported that they fainted while at work. Why do they faint? You know, the fainting of garment workers was first noticed in Cambodia. 
and it was passed off as, oh, this is women getting hysterical. There is mass hysteria, and so you have all these women fainting. But over time, the research showed it is not hysteria. It is simply nutrition and very high demands of production, which, is, which are leading to women fainting. So what do they do when they faint? We have seen here again in India that all these women, they end up taking a glucose trip. So you, to be able to go back to work, you take a glucose trip because you just don't have en enough energy in your body. Now, if you and I were to keep taking glucose drips the way these women do, I don't know what will happen to our health. I mean, we can't keep taking a glucose drip every year or two years every time we are working. So, but that's what does happen to them. Previously in this course, we learned about the standards set out in India's national labor laws for the conditions of work, including standards of occupational safety and health. Let us learn about some international standards related to these conditions of work. The Hours of Work Industry Convention 1919, which is ILO Convention No. 1, provides that the working hours of persons employed in any public or private industrial undertaking, subject to a few examples, shall not exceed 8 in the day and 48 in the week. India has ratified this convention. The Maternity Protection Convention of 2000, which is Convention No. 183, provides for 14 weeks of maternity benefit to women to whom the instrument applies. Women who are absent from work on maternity leave shall be entitled to a cash benefit which ensures that they can maintain themselves and their child in proper conditions of health and with a suitable standard of living and which shall be no less than two-thirds of her previous earnings or a comparable amount. The convention also requires ratifying states to take measures to ensure that a pregnant woman or nursing mother is not obliged to perform work that has been determined to be harmful to her health or that of her child and provides for protection from discrimination based on maternity. The standard also prohibits employers from terminating the employment of a woman during pregnancy or absence on maternity leave or during a period following her return to work, except on grounds unrelated to pregnancy, childbirth and its consequences or nursing. Women returning to work must be returned to the same position or an equivalent position paid at the same rate. It also provides a woman the right to one or more daily breaks or a daily reduction of hours of work to breastfeed her child. India has not ratified this convention. The Occupational Safety and Health Convention of 1981, which is Convention number 155, requires countries to adopt a coherent national occupational safety and health policy to take action to promote occupational safety and health and to improve working conditions. The policy has to be developed by taking into consideration national conditions and practice. India has not ratified this convention. The Occupational Health Services Convention of 1985, which is convention number 161, provides for the establishment of enterprise-level occupational health services that are tasked to prevent and reduce risks to the health of workers by advising the employers, the workers and their representatives on maintaining safe and healthy work environments. India has not ratified this convention. These are standards that apply to workers generally. Some workers, however, are particularly vulnerable and require special protections. Their vulnerability may arise from the nature of work they do. For example, there are Indian laws that provide special protection to workers employed in plantations and mines. The Plantation Labour Act of 1951 applies to some types of plantations. State governments can include other plantations by notification. These plantations are required to provide and maintain medical facilities for workers and their families, housing accommodation for workers with six months of continuous service and their families, crash facility if 50 or more women workers are employed or were employed on any day of the preceding 12 months, adequate supply of drinking water, separate sanitary toilets and washing facilities, umbrellas, blankets, raincoats or similar amenities for the protection of workers from rain or cold. The Act also provides, for example, that no adult worker is required or allowed to work in any plantation in excess of 48 hours a week and no adolescent for more than 27 hours a week. The Safety and Health in Construction Convention of 1988, which is Convention number 167, provides for detailed technical, preventive and protective measures in relation to the specific requirements of the construction sector. These measures relate to the safety of workplaces machines and equipment used, work at heights 
and work executed in compressed air. India has not ratified this convention. The Safety and Health in Mines Convention 1995, which is Convention 176, the Safety and Health in Agriculture Convention 2001, which is Convention 184, and the Chemicals Convention 1990, which is Convention 170, contain special standards of protection for workers in the mining, agriculture, and chemical industries. For example, the Mines Convention prescribes standards relating to mine rescue. The Chemicals Convention prescribes policies related to safety during the production, the handling, the storage, and the transport of chemicals. The Plantations Convention of 1958, which is Convention number 110, and its protocol, cover the recruitment and engagement of migrant workers and sets out standards for plantation work in respect of employment contracts, wages, working time, medical care, maternity protection, accident compensation, freedom of association, labor inspection, and housing. The Nursing Personnel, the Nursing Personnel Convention of 1977, which is Convention 149, requires states to ensure that nursing personnel enjoy conditions at least equivalent to those of other workers in the country in relation to hours of work, including regulation and compensation of overtime, inconvenient hours and shift work, weekly rest, paid annual holidays, educational leave, maternity leave, sick leave, and social security. India has not ratified these conventions. The Domestic Workers Convention of 2011, which is convention number 189, requires member states to take measures to ensure the effective promotion and protection of the human rights of all domestic workers and take the measures to respect, promote, and realize the fundamental principles and rights at work, namely, a freedom of association and the effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining, b. the elimination of all forms of forced or compulsory labor, c. the effective abolition of child labor, and d. the elimination of discrimination in respect of employment and occupation. India has not ratified this convention. The vulnerability of workers may also arise from other factors such as interstate migration, or non-regular employment under contract. These are some factors that are common in informal work. The Interstate Migrant Workmen Regulation of Employment and Conditions of Service Act 1979 requires that contractors or organizations that employ migrant workers register the workers and obtain licenses from states from where the laborers are migrating for work. The employment of migrant workers without registration is prohibited. The wage rates, holidays, hours of work and other conditions of service of an interstate migrant worker shall be the same as those of other workers in the same establishment if the nature of their work is similar. The Contract Labor Regulations and Abolition Act of 1970 prohibits the employment of contract labor in some establishments and in establishments where it is permitted, regulates the manner of employment and sets standards for the conditions of work. For instance, it requires the licensing of contractors. The contractor has to maintain various registers and records, display notices, and issue employment cards to workers. Among other things, the contractor has to ensure payment of wages and other facilities such as canteens, restrooms, toilets, drinking water, and creches. If the establishment is not registered, or if the contractor is not licensed, then the worker is deemed to be a direct employee of the principal employer. This would mean that the principal employer, this would mean that the principal employer would be liable for the wages and the conditions under which the worker is working. The Homework Convention 1996, which is Convention number 177, requires member nations to adopt, implement, and periodically review a national policy on homework aimed at improving the situation of home workers. Such a national policy shall promote as far as possible equality of treatment between home workers and other wage earners in relation to their freedom of association rights, their protection against discrimination in employment and occupation, the protection of their safety and health, their remuneration, their social security protection, their access to training, the minimum age for admission to employment or work, and maternity protection. India has not ratified this convention. The Occupational Safety, Health and Working Conditions Code of 2020 
intends to replace many of the national laws that we have discussed so far, but has not yet been brought into effect. But as I mentioned, when they leave the factory, they often are pushed into becoming home workers. They also become home workers in another period, and that is when their childbearing years, because most factories don't give either maternity benefits, nor certainly many, very few have a crash for child care. So what happens is that the women are forced out between the ages of 25 to 30 when they are having children or between a little earlier. And that is the time they then work at home. Otherwise also there are those who are home workers. Now the home worker is doubly exploited at first. First of all, they are called the invisible workers because they don't exist in the value chains. If you go and ask any factory, They'll tell you, no, no, we don't give any work outside the factory. All of the work is done in the factory. But if you go to Bareilly or if you go even around in, uh, in, in the other, you know, go around Tirupur, etc., around these garment clusters, you will find that there is work given at home. Two kinds of work are given. One is hand embroidery and the other is finishing tasks like, you know, cutting the threads and so on, minor jobs like that, or even putting, uh, putting on tags and things like that. Now, of course, they don't give brands, they don't give you the garment with a brand name because they're scared that the, some media may come and take a photograph or videograph this where the women are working with certain brand name clothes after they had trouble when they, you know, the Gap brand was found on certain garments that were being worked on by children. So they didn't want this kind of thing happening again. So now they don't give you that. But the point is, first of all, they do. They are forced into this, and they. But with, uh, but they're not just workers. The problem is that on top of getting a low wage, they also are forced to supply or buy their own equipment for work, like the needles. They don't buy thread because thread will is an important uh, input, and you cannot afford to have a variation in the quality of the thread. But whether it is needles or scissors or even a sewing machine. And plus, of course, the space on which you work and the electricity and all of that for working, all, all that cost is borne by the worker. That reduces, therefore, the actual re remuneration that is being paid to the women. Now, even in home working, you'll find a gender difference. Men work for one also do homework. There are many women, men who are home workers, but they, one is they tend to work for longer stretches of time. They, you know, they don't have the burden of childcare and having to be multitasking, as we say. Therefore, they're able to concentrate. So, secondly, they usually have a separate uh, space for their work, which is a room adjoining the main room in which they live. Women don't have a separate space. They work from within their living space itself. So men also work much more than and earn more as home workers than women do. So there's a gender difference even in home working. So these are the two main categories of women or garment workers. One is as factory workers and the second as home workers. Now I didn't mention, but I'll just mention a large number of these factory workers are what is called contract labor that is indirectly employed by contractors and not by the company itself directly. They do not have permanent status. Therefore, it is very easy to remove them from employment whenever they want to be removed, whenever they want them to be removed, like it happened during the lockdowns which India went through when all of these women were thrown out. Some have gone back, but not all have been taken back. So that depends on what uh, on the extent of what is that they have. And so there are these problems of uh, the very precariously employed women workers in the garment factories. Employment and contract places workers in a precarious position in their relationship with the employer. But it also adversely affects them in their relationship with other workers whose employment is more secure. We know from the previous module that women are more likely to be pushed into such non-regular work arrangements. It contributes to their exploitation, insecurity and vulnerability. The employment of workers on a non-regular basis for work that is actually of a regular nature is an example of another work-related evil 
that labor law seeks to correct. We will learn about the prohibition of some exploitative practices in the next video, including the law related to violence and harassment at work. Thank you for watching.